And it's nice to see Jane on stage here, although we do see each other a lot in the city because uh, she lives literally around the corner from the drawing center. Because so. he's a smoker. Exactly. That's so I'm standing outside and we have a lot of waving uh, going on. Uh, thank you for talking about my vices. We'll get that out of the way right now. Anything else that we should discuss? Um, so uh, Jane is an artist who has worked a lot with paper. Um, and But I would say that Jane is really more a multidisciplinary artist who thinks in a lot of different kind of mediums. And today we wanted to walk through um, some of the projects that she's been working on over the years to give a little bit of context and then focus on maybe some of the works that you can see at Gallery Lalong's booth here at the Drawing Now Fair. Um, but before we begin, I, I just wanted uh, to say that for me, that the, the title of this talk would be called Search Engine. I think Jane's work is really like a kind of search engine. This is the way that you put together ideas. Um, you're very interested in maybe networks of knowledge, how th images can kind of move into other ideas, um, how you connect things. And so I was thinking a lot about that as a kind of starting point. But before we get into the work, there was one thing that I wanted to mention and just ask a question, Jane. Um, when I, before I became involved in the art world, I also went to UCSD to study medicine. And I know that you went to Mount Holyoke um, and wanted to be a doctor. Did that influence your artistic career in any way? Well, I would say that the part of me that wanted to be a doctor is alive and well as I'm an artist. That is an interest in um, exploring, uh, observing closely taxonomy, the relationships between things. This is a piece I made about 10 years ago. When I was a kid, I did this thing where I made a grid in our property, 50 feet by 50 feet in the woods, and then I made a book, and then I identified everything inside the grid, the rocks, the beetles, the leaves, etc., and recorded it in the book. This is a book I made maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I made the butterflies. I gave the butterflies binomial nomenclature in Latin, you know, the two-part thing that everything has. There's a glossary on the back. But my Latin was fictional, so like the green butterfly translates Latin-wise as uh, jade thief. So it's a sort of a mix of fact and fiction. That's where my heart really lies. So in a way, that kind of analytical, research-based um, process, but married to a more artistic and possibly yes. personally driven narrative yes. might be the thing that you took into the next phase of yes. your thinking. Good. Yeah, good yeah. point, yeah. Um, I did want to ask, is it possible that we could lower the lights a little bit by the, the stage just so we could see the images a little bit better? If, if that's possible, I don't know if anyone can help us with that. Well, we'll see. Yeah, maybe someone has to translate that. Uh, yeah. Merci, no. okay, that might, very good. good, thank you. Um, paper has played a very important role as a medium in your, as a material in your oeuvre over the years. Um, you've even said that you privilege paper over pencil. Um, why is it that paper is so foundational to you? Well, for one thing, I'm a person that works from found information. I take found things and I make something new out of it. And until the rise of the internet, all that found information was basically printed information on paper. So some of the forms that have influenced me are things like matchbooks and matchbook advertising. This is an oil painting. Map making and cartography. You'll see a map here today at the fair. Packaging and product advertisement. This is a series of paintings that are the boxes that fictional products would come in. Uh, you see here the, is a painting in the shape of a piece of notebook paper itself. I've made a number of book-shaped paintings. But then I've also made a lot of pieces with paper and with very particular kinds of paper. This is a memorial I made for American soldiers killed in the war in Iraq. It consists of 4,500 unique leaves, each with the name of a soldier written on the back. So I had to choose a kind of paper that would sound right, that would feel right, that would mold to the right shape. This is a unique book I made. Um, it's a Spanish dictionary 
with Hebrew pages hiding inside the cover. Um, and I used, that's papyrus right there, all different kinds of papers, but to kind of have this sense of age. This is a life-size print I made, and I had the Gompi paper custom made in Japan, so it would have that impression like tattooing can have where the image is like not really on the paper, but sort of in the paper, a little bit below the surface. There's a close-up. Um, this piece might be here in the fair, and the idea is everything is based on items in 50s novelty catalogs. It's hand-drawn. It's hand-drawn to look like it's a print of an object, not the object itself. But when you examine it closely, you'll see that there's like 45 kinds of white paper in there. So it's black and white. From a distance, it looks the same. And then when you get up close, it kind of rewards close inspection. I think that's UC Ross. I mean, oh. OK, well, this then <laughs> leads us to the next question, which was, uh, where do you find your source material? And obviously, here you are looking through yeah, a friend of stacks mine, of postcards. Or yeah, photographs, snapshots yeah. at the flea market. Somebody else took this picture and sent it to me the other day. And I thought, this will be fine for my talk. So um, I taught in Baltimore, Maryland for 10 years. And I spent three nights a week down there. And those three nights of the week, I spent in the library. And that was true for all 10 years. And it might probably wouldn't have been true if I'd been in New York. I wouldn't have gone to the public library three nights a week. So it began that way. And then I began collecting antiquarian books. And then I began going to book fairs and ephemera fairs. Then that segued into collecting snapshots. And now I would say I'm a person that spends probably the first hour, an hour and a half of every day. Like some people meditate. I like look for shit on them on the internet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and also you were saying even here, you know, you've built relationships with dealers. Yes. Um, so you, yeah. everywhere you go around the world. I mean, I'm a little bit the same way. I collect 50s dishes. So I always go to every flea market yeah. or um, yeah. antique store, uh, even if I'm in Oklahoma or Omaha or whatever it is, uh, you have to go and you're look. You're collecting the thing and you're collecting the sources for the exactly. thing at the same right. time. Yeah. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you um, actually something very specific because you use manicure scissors for your collages. It's a little out of the ordinary, but what, what, what manicure scissors do you use and which ones do you recommend? I own about 45 <laughs> pairs of scissors. Um, I have scissors handmade in India for tailors. Okay. I have a lot of cheap Fiskars spring-loaded <laughs> scissors. I use them for about four months and throw them out, so they are all dated on them. And I have Hoffritz manicure scissors, and I have, probably have some kinds I don't even know the names of. Well, I figured I would ask you because yeah. I would assume that this would be an area where you would be also uh, collecting and thinking about And that. tons of X-Acto knives with the cold steel blue blades, you know, blah, blah, blah. I do recommend, Jane, if you ever go to Finland, uh, go visit the Fiskars uh, factory. Oh, wow. It's pretty unbelievable, <laughs> and, and that they really give you the, the whole history of scissor That's making. That's great. Um, Finland's on my list. All right, we'll get you over there. Uh, you've worked in a lot of different mediums, sculpture, painting, collage, photography, printmaking. I mean, we saw just from the slides that you went through um, how many different ways you, you're, you use uh, all kinds of media in your work. Are you interested in how different ideas play out in different mediums, or is there one primary idea that you're kind of working out in each medium? No, I'm not a primary idea type person. I'm not an essentialist. I'm not... I don't have themes, I don't have an over, I'm, I'm interested in exploration and thinking and establishing kind of connections between things that might mirror the process of thinking itself or the nature of the internet itself or what we once called free association, but now we're not so clear how free it is. Um, but I'm not someone that has a theme or an overriding story like I'm always angry at my father or I was born in the camps or, you know, whatever. I'm. Um, I mean, it probably does relate to my biography because people invented a lot of stories around me when I was a child, but I'm interested in how one story changes into another one. So the different mediums that you work in are just simply expressions of the idea that you're pursuing. When I get an idea, it's, it's already embedded in a medium. And that's so just it's like, kind of this is going to be a painting. I never think, oh, collage. like, is this an etching or is this a photograph? It just like comes into my head as something and I see it that way. That's the easiest part of my job. 
Okay. Well, you know, as you say, you're not an essentialist, but you did at one point in your career only work with about 276 images um, from a very from very diverse categories, and then kind of endlessly recombine them into right. these collage-like paintings. So, yeah. why did you want to work within this type of system, and why did you want to create some kind of artificial limit on the type of images that you could use to generate your work? Partially, I think I'm, I'm of the age, like I came of age in the late 70s, and I was very interested in people like Barry LeVay and Richard Serra. So I think that systems-based kind of art making, where you have a strategy or an idea, before you do it, you can say what it is you're going to do, you know? I think I'm very influenced by that, even though my work superficially doesn't appear to be like that. The idea of having parameters and then exploring all kinds of freedom inside those parameters just fits with me. Well, I do think that then the next thing is, though, that because you do combine the conceptual with the handmade, these are often two things that, that really seem at odds with each other. How do you reconcile that? Um, because I would say that, you know, I view you really as a, a conceptual artist, but your work reads as something different on, yeah, on first glance. Yeah, it has a sensual, yeah. tactile quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For some reason yesterday, I was thinking about this story that I read when I was reading about Julia Childs, and when she was first learning how to cook, and she was living here, she went around France interviewing a lot of French women, in particular, in the country about how they cooked. And this one woman said to her, a meal should have some internal consonants. Maybe she didn't use that phrase. And the example she gave was she was roasting a lamb, and she took some juice from the lamb, and she poured it into the vinaigrette. So there was a connection subliminally between the salad and the meat. That kind of thing where you're doing something that's physical and sensual, but you also have an idea around what you're doing. I mean, I think it's more odd that we separate those two things. We, as human beings, we're hardwired to think conceptually, and we're also hardwired to like chocolate, you know? And it doesn't feel like a conflict as you live that. So I just put things together that felt right to me that maybe had been separated before me. Well, there, there might be, of course, other, in a way, other precedents, too. I mean, I, I recently just worked with Jennifer Bartlett, and I was thinking about Jennifer in relationship to a very systematic and highly conceptual approach, but then she moves also into these pastels, pastels and, and landscapes and figurative work. Yes. And so to She's reconcile these two yeah. things, although they, they do have a kind of distinct break. She's barely ever putting the two things together um, in one panel, uh, but... I, I like the idea that she's moving, that she has that fluidity. Right. Um, well, th that would then bring me to one other aspect of your work, which is game theory. Um, you know, you seem to have uh, been I very think. interested in game theory and employed a lot of chance operations as part of the, your compositional strategies. Um, what is interesting to you about games in relationship to art? Uh, obviously, there's a long history of that, and, and surely in Dadaist and Surrealist automatic drawing, I mean, this idea of chance or John Cage, um, can you talk a little bit about why that became something that was important to you? I think games are interesting more, less in terms of art and more in terms of life. All cultures have games. And they have games because games mirror life, because life itself is a kind of heady cocktail of chance and strategy. And that's what most games are about. I don't really think of this as a game, but it's the only painting I've ever made that's rigorously about chance. It's two paintings together that are 400 squares, and I designed six dice-based operations, and the colors and numbers and patterns are totally determined by chance, and I didn't know what they would be before I made the painting. And then, of course, that's only interesting if you do the same thing with the same parameters a second time. Well, the most interesting thing is to observe how the two paintings are alike and different from each other. I've also made paintings based on existing games, like this is a game that harkens from the Middle Ages called The Game of a Goose, and this is a painting I made where I sort of made the painting according to the rules of the game, and I also made a print that way too. I actually found a game board in the Marais, which was my inspiration for that. This is a recent painting called Snapshot Odyssey, which is a board game about me collecting photographs. 
and it has a rule book that comes with it too, so it actually does kind of function. I've made a series of rebus paintings. They thwart how you normally look at a painting. You read the left side, top to bottom, left to right, separately from the right side, same way. Um, this is a rebus that spells Dizzy Gillespie on the left and Brigitte Bardot on the right, and it's called And God Created Tunisia. Um, and this is one that spells Charles Darwin on the left and Marilyn Monroe on the right, and it's called Some Species Like It Hot. Then I made a series of little rebuses that are more oral. This is Blind Lemon Jefferson, Tiger Woods. Oh, okay. Well, and actually, humor is something that you also don't seem to shy away from. Um, I mean, I'd say that, you know, kind of, even in the titles, I mean, people were laughing. I mean, I, I think, Jane, you know, sometimes your work has a kind of humorous side. Um, is that something, in, in contemporary art, we don't, I don't know, humor seems to be... Humor is very degraded. Yeah, Somebody, it's not... Rob it's Storr not some... wrote something about this once, which I thought was very interesting. I mean, I think polka is kind of playful sometimes, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I, in general, it's considered sort of a lower um, form of discourse, and I, I think that's a very inappropriate. I think humor is right up there with everything else. And basically, it's not like I want to be funny all the time, but I want to be everything in my art that I could be in my life. I don't want my art to feel that I have to, I have to streamline my identity in order to be an artist. An artist. Being an artist should be a vessel where you're your biggest self, not your smallest, most homogenized self. Well, I mean, I think it, it becomes very apparent when you look at your whole oeuvre, you know, that, that again, the idea of wordplay, language, humor, being a little bit, um, I, I mean, I don't see a lot of irony necessarily in your work or cynicism. I mean, that may be there, but, you know, it, it, that, that's important. I mean, I, it reminds me a little bit, I, I did a show with Leon Golub, um, and I ended up with Nancy Spiro and looking through these late Golub drawings, and they were quite intense, they were a little bit pornographic, but he had these statements, and they were so funny. And I started laughing, and Nancy said, "You know what? I'm really glad that you think they're funny, um, because they were darkly funny." Yeah. And I, and I and she said, "You know, humor was important to Leon, and you know, we we wouldn't really think of Leon Golub as someone who was interested in humor, but I, I did think that that was interesting that he was um, putting that forward yep. as something that was there." Um, Okay, so now I want to move into talking about a specific medium for a moment. Um, it seems that since 2007, photography has been something that's been really much more dominant for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about what photography offers you maybe that other mediums do not? Yeah, I mean, I actually started in late 2004 making the photos, and it came out of collecting various things and that led to buying snapshots online and I kind of just fell in love with buying snapshots online and then the next minute I had 900 snapshots I had no idea what I was going to do with and I was organizing them and constantly changing the criteria for the organization when I went into the kitchen to make dinner and realized one of them was in my head only to realize that I had misremembered and braided together five or six photographs into one fictional photograph. And I thought, wow, this is something I want to do. So then I proceeded to sort of figure out how to make a certain kind of photo collage that I wanted to make, at the same time expanding my practice of collecting photographs. This is an example. This is a photograph that's 16 by 20. It's a collage of probably 14 found photographs. Um, and Which you're doing through Photoshop. Which I'm doing through Photoshop and then converting to an LVT negative and then printing it in a dark room as a silver gelatin print. So it's a silver gelatin print of something that never happened. But your question was, what's interesting to me about photography? And I think it's mainly two things. One is... Although sophisticated people know that photographers have done fictional things all along in their photography, for most of us, a small black and white photograph is freighted with a kind of factuality that a large, colorful oil painting isn't. You think of it as some kind of truth, as a representation of some kind of simultaneity of time and place, etc. So that's a very fun thing to play with and it's very interesting conceptually to play with it. The second thing is that in a photograph, particularly if it has 
good resolution and a kind of granularity, there is this shared experience. There's the feeling of, I know what that inner tube feels like on a hot day. I know what it sounds like when it's dry and you draw your fingers across it. I know what that sand feels like. I know what that suntan oil smells like. It's all this kind of shared cultural experience and natural experience that I think photography really traffics in, in an amazing way. Did you have a chance to read those Errol Morris um, articles that he was writing in the Times about the veracity of photography and his book, uh, Seeing is Believing? No, I didn't no. read that. You know, the, but Go ahead. No, I was saying that, I mean, just to go back to the idea of the, you know, the, the photograph as truth, I mean, he talks about that famous photograph of the cannonballs in the um, Valley of Death, and actually that that's a staged photo. So this yes, idea yes. that even, you know, these kind of received historical photos, and it is true, I think, Jane, you're, you're absolutely right. The photograph does give us, it, it's a real memory jogger. I mean, it kind of allows us to be, maybe even more than painting, um, yes. be present with very tactile memory associations. If I do a painting and there's a window in the painting and there's a curtain on the window, you look at it and you think, this is how Jane Hammond paints a curtain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If but I have that in a photograph, you think, wow, my sister had those curtains in her room. You know, it like speaks to you in the ether between us in a different way than painting. It also has a different relationship to temporality. And here you're obviously stitching together multiple temporalities and multiple spaces um, because those are six or seven or 14 photographs right. that are put together and they may not all be from exactly the same time frame. Right. I mean, I when I bought this monkey, in the end I made this monkey out of like seven other monkeys, but I bought this monkey, I thought he's going to be looking at a couple kissing. I have a huge collection of kissing couples. They're almost all banal. But this couple was really great to me but I really didn't like her dress. So I put my polka dot dress on my studio assistant, made her pretend she was making out with that guy, and then took the picture. So it's two pictures I found in a flea market in Germany and one I took five minutes before. Should we move to um, the Dazzle paintings? Sure. This is a game, by the way. This is a new photograph and it's called The Pears Game. And that guy in the camouflage jumpsuit is hiding his eyes and then he has to pick out who gets paired with who. It's a game I made up. So um, you have been working on a series of uh, works called Dazzle Paintings, which you first showed at Gallery Le Long here in Paris, I think in 2010. That's right. Um, could you talk a little bit about the process of how these paintings are constructed and what materials you use? Because also they are photographically based. Yeah, they're photographically based. This is based on a found snapshot. I'll show you like a couple. This is, I don't know if you can see this well. I titled it Puppets, but it's two men pretending as a joke to lynch each other. So it's... And is that from a real photograph? Yes, I didn't change it at all, oh. really. Uh, huh. Another rope photo. Um, basically, what happened was photography changed the way I thought about painting. And I wanted to make a different kind of painting that had a slipperier, more temporal kind of character. And I wanted to make something that was worked with my collection of snapshots, but I didn't want to make photorealism because that's already been done and I never was that crazy about it anyhow. And I was really groping and searching, and then I found some mica, and it was translucent, but variably so, colorless, but a little colored, and it just felt right to me. It was mineral, and so basically I made stretchers, quote unquote, of clear plexiglass over wood. And then I mounted the mica on top of the plexi, and then I built this kind of highly reflective topography in the space behind it. And back to our comments about early science, just experimented a lot with how the light and the changing light would interact with the image. Um, between the snapshot and the hand-painted image on the painting is a, is a series of computer processes that change 
the snapshot into something that's a more vector-based, binary kind of image. Um, and I have a person do that for me. And so one of the interesting things about the paintings to me is that the snapshot is a kind of frozen moment in time in a stream of moments that doesn't really have too much of, it, of the before and after of that moment inside of it. And the dazzle paintings, by virtue of the fact that the, the dazzles, the units of reflection, are angled differently, as you walk in front of the painting, as you traverse in front of the painting, the painting changes. So it's a different painting from the left and the center and the right, and it's changing as you're moving. So I feel like it sort of like restores to the snapshot some of the actuality of the flow of the moment, like Henri Berson kind of thinking that was there, that, that it was plucked from in the first place. I mean, I was also thinking a little bit of, I, I mean, I'm, it's maybe an obscure reference, but the Dazzle Ships, do you know those? The, um, yes, I do. I yeah. didn't know about them when I started this series of paintings, but of course, when you Google that word, that's something that comes up, and I saw one in London, a, a restoration of one. And so the they, they're camouflage ships um, that were in World War II. They're built to go away. Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking a little bit about camouflage also yes. and the revealing and yes. uh, of seeing things. And I think in the Dazzle paintings, you definitely have that experience. Yep. Um, the other thing is that the, the images themselves, although they're quite banal, often people at lying down or yep. resting or looking like doing some leisurely activity, there's also a little bit of a kind of sinister... I don't want to say, well, no, there's a little bit of a no. darkness um, in all of these images. The two guys lynching each other, um, the woman lying down with the kind of the boot next yes, to her, yes. which looks, you know, yes. like something ominous is going yeah. to happen. Um, this might seem a little bit more like just sunbathing, but we, we just don't know what's happening. So you have caught this kind of awkward moment. Is that something it's you were something thinking about? It's something I really look for. I mean, I own now 15,000 snapshots. It's very, there are very few of them that I think would make a good dazzle painting. I mean, most of them I've bought because I want to take them apart. I'll buy a photograph for the alarm clock on the dresser. So it's hard to find something, but like in this particular one, Doc, it's this woman with her back turned that appeals to me because you don't really know how she's addressing the other people. If she weren't there, I think it's too banal. Um, here at Drawing Now, you're showing four new Dazzle drawings. Those are different. Um, they're made with Sumi ink on Gampy paper with gold leaf. Um, how do you find that these relate to the Dazzle paintings? And are, no. Sorry, are they also, are they coming before you make the paintings or are there a whole separate body of work? They actually have come after, although this is an image I processed to make a Dazzle painting. I've never made the painting. So if I make the painting, then this one, the answer will be before. They're, they're really small, and they were kind of influenced by oratones, which is a kind of photograph that has gold behind an image, a photographic image on a piece of glass, which I thought I was going to make, and actually I've never made the oratones, but looking into it has kind of led me to these drawings, which is kind of how my practice works. I wander around, and things lead to other things. Um, I wanted to move to another series, uh, the All Souls series. So in 2004, um, from what I've read, you had a dream and you began a new series of works. Uh, the first one was of a borderless map of Iraq and it's a meeting environment uh, covered with it. butterflies. Yeah, this is um, it. Which you created by scanning real insects and then collaging, painting their paper borders and applying horsehair or false eyelash antenna. Um, the thing about this work is that there's a really disjunctive juxtaposition of this incredibly dangerous war-torn place that you know is still a, a real hotbed of problems in our world with the beauty of butterflies. Yeah. Um, what was the point of that statement? I mean, wh why that disjunction of the kind of the horror of Iraq and the, 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 the beauty of the butterfly. I mean, it, you know, it, is it a political statement? Is it a statement about... Yeah, fundamentally it is a political statement, but I don't actually work from a point to the art. What happened to me is on the day of September 11th, 2001, in my apartment in New York, I had a visitation to my window box of 30 monarch butterflies. Then when the United States started bombing in Iraq, I had a dream because I was watching a lot of aerial photography and cartography. I had a dream in which there was a map of the Middle East covered in butterflies. 
Now, I'm not saying all dreams are worthy of actually making the piece. You have to then subject that dream to some process of analysis in the light of day. Is this an interesting idea? What is this about? What does this mean, et cetera? So I thought of the idea of making a very old, worn, sort of archeological feeling map. They're made of like 40 pieces of paper and I grind and sand on them on the floor and I flood them with water, et cetera. And kind of marrying that with the freshness, ephemerality, and beauty of the butterflies. But I guess I was also thinking no other animal connotes cycles of living and dying more than a butterfly. I mean, if you'd never seen or heard of the idea of the human soul and you saw a butterfly throughout its life cycle, the, the idea that you could mitigate into something entirely different would seem completely plausible to you. So the, I, the idea was to uh, connote cycles of living and dying in these places. And the places were completely fraught. It was like, this is Uganda, it was like Vietnam, Rwanda, South Africa, Bosnia, and then as I got more into it, the lens kind of expanded on me and I became interested in split places, like an island that's three or four countries. Uh, so like Dominican Republic, Haiti could yeah, be one yeah, or something. Yeah, Borneo, right. I've done, you know, Korea, um, then certain kinds of peninsulas, etc. And the map that I have here which is Luxembourg, oddly enough, comes, I had a commission for the US State Department to do a map of Laos, and Laos is a landlocked country. So when you do an island, you have the distinction between the land and the water creates a composition for you. You're not actually in charge of it, you're the framer of it. When you do a landlocked country, you're basically making a kind of field painting, like a Pollock or something, and then the question becomes, how can you frame the country so it can at least be seen a little bit? How can you have enough change over the course of the land so it's an interesting composition, et cetera? So after I did Laos, I kind of felt excited about the idea of doing that. So I was sort of looking for another landlocked country, and that's how I came to Luxembourg. And, and what decisions did you make in terms of outlining? I mean, are you actually drawing the borders there? I did draw you, the borders here, which yeah. had been anathema to me uh, in the beginning because I started with Iraq where the borders right. themselves are part of the problem, you know? This guy wrote this thing in the Times the other day. It's like, look at all the countries of the world. If they have more than two straight lines as their border, there's a war there. I thought it was if they had McDonald's, uh, yeah. then that was the No, it's the, the vestiges of colonialism. So... Um, so if you look at the map that's in the Lalong booth, you'll see it's very kind of subtle and nuanced coloristically, if, if I do say so. Um, I wanted to skip over, if we can, to the math drawings. I think we're going to run out of time in a couple of minutes, and I did want to take oh, there's a detail. one or uh, two questions if anyone had questions. Okay, so we're going to skip the shirts. Yeah, if you okay, don't mind. Okay, that's fine. I okay. hope I have a de No, I don't have a detail, I don't think, of these. No, nope, I don't. Let me see if I can find it again. Okay, so the math drawings, I'll start talking while you're doing that. Um, I'm very interested in how a person that works with found information, the actual searching, the process of finding found things, it's a process of complete discovery when you go to the flea market. It's a process of a more targeted kind of searching when you go to the internet. Sometimes you go somewhere and you're looking at a dealer who sells old photographs, but then you learn something. You don't want this photograph, but you learn something about photography from seeing it. And I think the internet has really changed, for those of us that work with found information, the nature of the finding itself. So I had made those shirts which have to do with hunting and foraging. And then I decided to make a series of pieces, or one piece in the beginning, that was about mathematics, because I'd stumbled on an interesting kind of Japanese mathematics. That was the beginning of it. One day, for no particular reason, I said to myself, what does math look like in Japan? And then I got to these Japanese temple drawings. So I made a series of searches, fractals, polyhedra, Johnsonian solids, toruses, like one math term led me to another. I didn't know what Johnsonian solids were when I started out. And then along the way, I was observant to the process of looking itself. And the algorithmic 
nature of searching pops up these really anomalous things along the way. Like you're looking for polar bears and then you come upon a pair of red shoes. They, they're, they're not polar bear brand, they don't have polar bears on them. You think, what are they doing there? So each one of these drawings also has within it a few anomalous things that are emblematic of the things that pop up along the way. It's hard to see this. Yeah, this I'm drawing. very sorry. I can't seem to make this well, uh, go to. There's two human faces at the top of this drawing, more to the right than the left. And what they are is impossible drawings. It's the same face right side up and upside down. So there's actually a couple of impossible drawings lodged within this matrix of mathematics. Kind of making this That's worse. Right. Um, well, you know, I was interested in in the math drawings because, again, um, going back to my title for our talk, uh, search engine. I mean, you were these are very much like maps of internet searches. I mean, as yes. if you were to yes. go ahead and expose that 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 network of kind of the algorithmic. If you like this, you'll like this. If you're yes. searching for that, yes. you search. You know, you'll you'll it's like be the moved. The slippery way that your mind moves when it thinks, like early in the morning or something like that. I mean, I was thinking this morning about how I'm old enough that when I came to New York, everyone was worshiping at the altar of minimalism. Everyone was worshiping about the grid, and the dominant words were gestalt psychology, unicity, purity, and non-relational, right? Judd said that a good composition, and Stella too, was non-relational. Well, guess what? The algorithm is burying the grid, and the algorithm is relational. And in the last 20 years of science on the human brain, the brain itself is relational. That's how you remember this berry looks like that berry. She got sick when she ate that one. We're not going to eat this one today, Brett. You know, I mean, that's how we're wired. But I do think in these works, I mean, not that your work has an opacity, but, you know, oftentimes, I mean, I think someone, you know, if you stood in front of the Dazzle painting, I'm not 100% sure that one would immediately read all of the things that yes. happen in terms yes. of the construction of that image. But in these works, I think maybe, you know, you, you've been very truthful because of even the wire apparatus, the kind of connecting form yes. is apparent. Yes. Um, and so in some ways, I, I think that, it, again, it's not about truthfulness, but it, you're exposing that background um, in the way in y which you're yes. putting the and work that... together. And I like that. I think that's that's a nice... Uh, kind of moment uh, in the in the math drawing. That three-dimensional scaffolding that these pieces are on, I think the way that it's exposed and the way that it like moves around topographically kind of rhymes with how you hunt and search. But I didn't have that idea and then go to it. I actually went to this opening and this woman had this kind of ugly but interesting necklace and I went up to her and said, what's the story on your necklace? And she said, this friend of mine made it with Q-tips, like the plastic kind. So I went out and got three boxes of Q-tips and cut all the tips off them and put wires inside them. And then after I had like eight on a wire together, you could make a simple gesture and you'd get like a geodesic dome. And it was really built, I mean, of course I had to sense that that was right in its application to this, but I kind of was open to finding it by accident, right. you know? Um, I want to stop the talk here and surely um, open it up to the audience if any has any, anyone has any questions for Jane. Um, unfortunately, my French is not good enough to do the translation, so if, if and you And mine can, is non-existent. Yeah, so we'd have to have a question only in English if that's possible. Does anyone have any questions for Jane? Yes. It's three-dimensional, but I personally use the word drawing for anything I make with paper. It's three-dimensional, but like that, you know. And all those individual items, which granted, they're hard for you to see, they're drawn on a paper called Gompi, which is a very thin version of it, so the paper's like tissue paper, and they're drawn with sumi ink and a brush pen, and then they're backed with Japanese silver leaf, so you actually look through the gompi at the silver, and it's like the gompi disappears. So it appears to be a series of drawings on Japanese silver leaf, but they're really, it's really multi-layered. Then they're backed with another piece of paper so that they're stiff and have this kind of planar look. 
and then maybe six or seven of them in each piece are painted fluorescent orange on the back, so they kind of glow onto their neighbor or onto the back sheet. And they're, they're like about this big, something like that. Yeah, I, you have to make these kind of pyramid, you have to make another structure so that there's points of contact to glue them, because they don't really naturally have much in common with the scaffolding until you build the understructure. You should look at Gago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that right? might be a yeah, good place yeah. to start for yeah. that understructure. Any other questions for Jane? Well, Jane, thank you so much. It's been you're really welcome. nice to thank chat you. again and um, hear a little bit more about what you're doing now. And uh, please visit the gallery uh, Le Long booth and take a look at Jane's work in person. I think it really deserves, uh, rather than looking at it in slides, yeah, it's hard. I mean, a lot of the work is very detailed, very three-dimensional. Um, and I thank you, Jane, for uh, talking to me today. And thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. So, au revoir. Thank you, everyone.